Um, so hi folks, I'm here Daya, I'm an IBM Distinguished Engineer CEO in our financial services sector. I wanted to present uh, a talk uh, on how we are leveraging event-driven architecture with Ignite for core application modernization. Now, I'm glad I, I managed to catch the last little bit of uh, Val's presentation, and I, I'm so happy that uh, there was code on the screen that you guys got uh, to see code. Uh, you know, as much as I tried wanting to show code in, in my session, I just wasn't able to, to put that in. So I'm, I'm glad that in the previous session, you were able to, to see some, some live coding and some code. Um, so let me uh, let me just uh, show you what my uh, uh, agenda looks like uh, for for this talk. So I want to speak about the challenges, right? Um, it, we are talking about modernization. I want to talk about the challenges that I see clients facing. Um, there's a lot of challenges, and I want to talk about the challenges uh, before we talk about what uh, what it is that uh, we're going to do to solve some of these challenges. And then I want to present this uh, this architecture that we have called the digital core. Uh, it's it's got a lot of aspects to it. So we're going to spend um, a good amount of time talking about the digital core, what it is, what are the things that make up the digital core, and Apache Ignite, the in-memory data grid, has a role to play in this digital core. And so we're going to talk about the role of Apache Ignite, and then I'm going to talk about some of the modernization patterns because. There's different reasons why um, you know clients that I work with want to modernize their applications, and there's different approaches that that uh, each of them use, and, and it really depends on what it what the application is, what are the objectives that the client is trying to achieve, and so on. And so we've got a few modernization patterns uh, that that I want to share, and then I'm going to talk about some lessons learned. Now my lessons learned are not going to be on modernization or the digital core or digital transformation. My lessons learned are going to be specifically on Ignite, okay? because this is the Ignite Summit and I want to make sure that we focus the lessons learned uh, on Ignite. And you know, when I first started putting the lessons learned together, I had like three, four slides on just lessons learned and I figured, okay, you know what? I, I'm going to pick the top four or five and focus on those top four or five uh, uh, lessons learned, okay? So let's uh, talk about the challenges. So organizations that have you know been around for some time, you know, um, face a lot of challenges, right? And and it, it those challenges are brought about by you know the number of years of gathering technical debt, right? So we're talking about applications. Their applications have been around for some time. Okay, these legacy applications require significant resources to maintain. In fact, I was at one of my clients, and they had done they'd done some number crunching and they said, you know, we've got this large development team and when they figured out where this development team was actually spending their time, 70% of their time was spent on maintenance. So their capacity for innovation was very small. You know, they spent 30% of their time on figuring out new things, new client experiences, you know, things that could help them compete against you know the new entrance in their 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 industry right so they were spending too much time on maintenance and the reason they were spending too much time on maintenance is that their applications had grown and over time because of adaptive maintenance and and, and so on they were become fragile right they would break often people didn't understand them anymore you know the documentation was old and it wasn't kept up to date so there was all sorts of issues why they were actually spending so much time on maintenance the other challenge has been uh, around data silos okay so you know you look at some of these large uh, enterprise clients that i work with and they literally have many many systems of record so when i say system of record i'm talking about a system that is the rightful owner of the data that it is managing it is a system of record for that data and they've got many some of them have you know 40 50 systems of record and uh, mergers and acquisitions makes the situation even worse. Now they've got two systems of record for the same kind of data, right? And so they weren't able to build interesting applications where they were combining data from different systems of record, combining it and using it in different contexts. So that's been one of their challenges as well. Um, and so to address these challenges, one, we want to figure out 
how can they become more agile? How can they improve their time to market? How can they make their applications more resilient and, and, and so on? And then how can they democratize all of this data and use all of this data in different ways? Because the data was stuck in these systems of record. Okay, it was siloed and they couldn't access it readily. Okay. And so what, what ended up happening was, you know, we spoke to several clients and they said, look, you know, we know we need to modernize our applications. We get it, right? And most clients get it. Their applications that are old, they need to modernize them. And, and so um, a lot of our clients said, look, I don't want to do one application at a time. Yeah, I could pick this one application. It's an important application. It's critical. Let's modernize it and, and you know, make it cloud native and microservices and all of those fancy things that, you know, most people, you know, relate to when we talk about application modernization. Uh, but they said, why don't we figure out what is the target state we want to get to? What is that target end state architecture we want to get to? And then let's modernize all of the applications to that target end state. And so we started digging into this one client and they basically said, look, we want to become an event driven organization. Okay. And so we're trying to figure out, okay, what does it mean to become an event driven organization? And the way we ended up phrasing it was, you know, they wanted every single client interaction. It didn't matter, you know, if the client was on their, uh, you know, on their website, whether the client was using their mobile app, whether the client was uh, speaking to someone, uh, you know, by phone at the call center, it didn't matter what that interaction was. They wanted that event to stream into the organization in real time. And what they wanted to become was they wanted to become really, really great at tapping into these events that were streaming in, into, in real time into the organization and extracting business value. And they wanted to take these events, unrelated events from different systems of record and bring them together, combine them and use them in different ways. And their thinking was, if we do that, we know exactly what our customers are doing in real time. You know, we can combine the data from all of these different systems of record in real time. We can use this data in different contexts and create client experiences that we can't even think of yet. Okay, that's what they wanted to do. And that's how we came up with this concept, which we're now calling the digital core. Uh, and I'm gonna walk you through what this pattern looks like. So the digital core is a target state architecture. It's obviously it's built around event-driven architecture that addresses some of these application modernization goals. So when you look at this, uh, this diagram, and this is a very high level view, um, you know, 30,000 foot kind of view. If you look on the left hand side, there are systems of record, right? This could be, you know, a SaaS provider that they're using for something. It could be, uh, uh, you know, a, a modern, you know, system of record that's built in, in J2EE running on some uh, JEE web server. Um, it could be almost anything, right? As long as it's a system of record and it's the rightful owner of the data. And what we were, what we wanted to do was to make sure that we had event streams from them, right? Because we want to know exactly what's happening in these applications when clients are interacting with them. And so we've democratized the data. Obviously, we need to get the data out uh, and do an initial load into what we call the event-driven book of reference, what you see in the middle there. But at the same time, we need to instrument these systems of records so that they transmit, they emit in real time transactional events that are happening in them. Okay, so there's two parts. One, let's get the data out. Let's get it into the event driven book of reference as an initial load and then instrument all of the systems of record so that they can emit in real time transactional events. Now, you know, yes, there's there were so many different kinds of applications we've dealt with. And in some cases, it's easy to instrument them. In other cases, not so much. So we do have a bunch of patterns that we've leveraged. Um, CDC change data capture is one that we have leveraged. And, you know, I think most people will know that change data capture, you know, you're, you're relying on the underlying database and the transaction log and you don't have to really make changes to the application. So, you know, most people kind of like that, that they don't have to change the application, especially applications that they're scared to change because they don't know that they're going to break something else. Right. So there's many different approaches we've used, but the idea is let's get the data into this event driven book of reference. Now, when the data comes into the event driven book of reference, we are ingesting it. We're using Kafka. You guessed that the event driven book of reference is Kafka and we're using Kafka Connect to ingest the data. 
and the data lands in a row landing zone. So it's sitting in Kafka topics in the row landing zone. And then we're doing some ingestion processing. Now that ingestion processing is basically a very important piece here because we are converting, we're transforming that data into an industry aligned data model. Okay, because when you've got many systems of record that you've built over time, many, many years, sometimes decades, or you've bought, uh, you know, uh, commercial off the shelf products, or you're using a SaaS provider, they're all following their own data model. And you want to align to an industry data model, you want to bring the data together, combine it, align to that industry aligned data model. Okay, and in some cases, we were combining data from multiple systems of record, combining it together, and it becomes one thing in the curated zone in the industry aligned data model. Okay, so now we have this curated zone and we've got data streaming in, in real time as events are occurring into this curated zone. So immediately you can see at the bottom, we now have the ability to create streaming applications. And that was an important aspect for many of my clients that are modernizing because they're trying to go from batch experiences to more real time experiences. You know, the, the banks want customers to experience banking in real time. You know, retail, same thing with all of the other industries. They want people to experience things in real time. And so these streaming applications now, can you can build some very interesting use cases because you have, you can, you can tap into any one of these uh, curated zone topics and get those real time events and take action in real time, get insights in real time and so on. Now, if you look at the top above that curated zone, you see the in-memory data grid. And this is where we like Apache Ignite because what's happening is now I've got this curated zone, I've got all of the data I need and I'm building channel experiences. I'm building channel experiences, whether it's a web, mobile, whether it's the IVR, I'm building these channel experiences that need to read data. And instead of previously, when they needed to create a new experience, most of the times when they're creating a new experience, they need to read data and they need to read data from many different systems of record. And previously they'd have to integrate with these many different systems of record. And those integration patterns were all very different depending on what kind of application it was and what technology stack it was. And now when they're building such experiences where they're, they need to read the data, they're integrating just with the in-memory data grid. And they've simplified the integration immensely. And the time to market for any one of these products, when we looked at it, most of the effort is spent in integration. It's trying to figure out how I integrate with all of these different systems of record. And so now they're able to release products so much faster because all they're integrating with is that in-memory data grid, which is Ignite for reads. Okay. The other very interesting thing is that uh, we found out that you know the data lake that they have and the warehouse that they have that they're using for their data analytics and you know the data scientists are busy working away that was being fed by back jobs right from all of the 40 50 systems of record nightly back jobs to feed that data lake and it wasn't it wasn't curated data it wasn't clean data it wasn't aligned to any industry data model it was not very effective and so when they see the curated zone and all of the systems of record and all of the data and all of the uh, data aligned to an industry data model, it was natural for everyone to say, hey, you know what, can we sync that data into the data lake instead of you know, taking all of the batch uh, files and ingesting them? And that made perfect sense. So you know, doing a sync into the data lake made sense. So in the, from the curated zone to the in-memory data grid, we're creating materialized views. Those materialized views are, are you know, basically what you want your API to query and you want to make it as fast as possible. So, uh, you know, what was important to us was speed and scale because two things, one speed, because it's a channel experience. You need this thing to be fast and scale because we've got lots of data, right? We we're getting the data from a lot of these, uh, systems of record into this, uh, curated zone. So when, we, when you look at a product, a client experience or a product uh, on this digital core pattern, it uses the CQRS pattern, right? It follows this vertical slice architecture. So, you know, you have the channel app on the upper left-hand side. It's, uh, you know, it's got a bunch of micro apps that are stitched together to create the channel experience. And the micro app has a micro front end that could be, you know, Angular. Uh, and then you have an experience API. So that experience API is just the normal 
back end for front end design pattern. And then you can see that the experience API is going to call one or more enterprise APIs. And again, you can see the reads and the writes are separate. So the queries are happening directly with Ignite on the right hand side that's kept up to date from the event driven book of reference. And you can see on the left hand side, all of the transactional events are, are continue to happen on the system of record. Okay, so a very modern CQRS pattern that is fed by you know, the event streaming uh, architecture, basically events flowing from the system of record into the event driven book of reference, getting ingested, some ingestion processing to align it to a data model, and then being projected into the uh, Apache Ignite for uh, uh, the materialized views, and then having the read API uh, read off of that uh, view in, uh, in, in Ignite. So let me uh, talk about why why Ignite why why you know we we have uh, got alternate solutions yeah absolutely uh, why we like Ignite so much uh, in in this space uh, a couple of things one um, you know it was all about speed and scale okay speed and scale were not negotiable for the work we were doing uh, with the digital core so queries from you know these customer facing channels where you know someone's on online on you know their online banking doing something you you have to have speed in terms of how quickly they're going to get their data so response times were extremely important and having it in memory as much in memory was important so we wanted a memory centric type solution right we, we didn't we wanted it to be memory first uh, you know not disk first we wanted it to be memory centric and, and so ignite was was great at that and we had lots of data Right. I, I, I mean, we have like 100, 100 plus terabytes of data sometimes. Um, so we needed to scale. So a distributed, you know, solution was extremely important. OK, so Ignite was 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 a great choice uh, for us to use uh, on top of the Kafka layer there. Um, a couple of uh, uh, options in terms of how we were getting data from Kafka into uh, Ignite. Um, now we have, uh, you know, we've we've worked with both of these. Uh, there's no one size fits all. Okay, you can use the uh, Kafka Connect. You can use Kafka Connect. We use Kafka Connect very heavily, uh, not just to put data into Ignite, but we use Kafka Connect to get, uh, uh, you know, other data from the systems of record into into Kafka as well. Right. So the advantage of Kafka Connect, obviously, it's. I don't want to say no coding. It's it, you do have little coding sometimes, uh, depending on what you're trying to do. Okay, but simple use cases, Kafka Connect makes sense. And you're basically taking advantage of the Kafka Connect architecture, which we know is scalable. We know how it's architected. And you know, you you take advantage of all of the monitoring capabilities that are there for Kafka Connect and so on. Now I want to make it very clear um, because you know I, I, we've looked at this quite a bit. Um, there is a community connector and there's the grid gain connector. Okay. I encourage people to make sure you understand what the differences are. Okay, if you are doing a you know production use case, you you know you really want to make sure you're using the the grid gain connector. There are aspects in there that uh, you know the guarantees in there that you absolutely need to take advantage of. Um, so be careful uh, what connector you use and make sure you understand what the what the differences are. Uh, by the way, I've even used the JDBC connector just 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 to give it a try and you understand uh, you know how things would behave if I use the a JDBC. Uh, uh, connector. I, I'd use, I believe, the Confluent JDBC connector to try the same thing and just use the Ignite JDBC driver under the covers. Um, so, so uh, you know, my preference is to use the grid gain uh, uh, connector uh, to, to do that. The other thing is when you need more control, you use the Kafka streamer uh, module uh, directly, okay? Um, because it gives you more control and you can do much more complicated use cases. You know, anytime you need to transform the data or, you, or you're doing complex joins, or maybe you need to reach out somewhere and enrich the data somehow, um, there's two, two things that you can use, right? You can use those stream transformers or you can use stream visitors. And there are differences between them. You know, I found some of these differences out the hard way, right? Uh, um, you know, usually you'll, you'll, you know, pull up your IDE and start coding things to give it a try and then find out, okay, you should have probably read the documentation a bit and, uh, you know, to figure out what those those subtle differences are, right? So the, the stream transformer, keep in mind, it's going to process only when the, the entry is actually in the cache, okay? And then it automatically writes to the cache, 
right? So it's a stream transformer. It's there. You're transforming stuff and it writes it to the cache. The stream visit, it's like a, you're visiting, right? So it, it it's going to process all entries, but it's not going to write it to the cache. You have to manually make sure that you write it to the cache. So don't use a stream visit and expect, uh, you know, the, uh, the cache to be updated. Okay, but um, I like uh, you know the Kafka Streamer approach. Uh, it is fast as hell, and uh, using the stream transformers and stream visitors gives you that uh, capability to control the data and do what you need to with the data. So I'm going to talk about some modernization patterns now, and I'm not going to spend too much time on the modernization patterns, uh, but uh, I, I think they are important. Um, so. Any large transformation initiatives is going to require several different modernization patterns. Okay, you could you could uh, you know want to create some new products, some new client experiences without changing any systems or record, right? Because you want to just innovate and get new product out there and compete. You know, disrupt some disrupt the, the industry or you know leapfrog some of your competition and so on. So you want to get the innovation out quickly. In that case, you would want to leave the systems or record alone and just create new product. In other cases. You know, you may have a system of record that's important to you and you want to incrementally modernize it, you know, using like the strangler pattern, right? Because you've got some technical debt. You may want to pay the technical debt off. You want to make it more resilient. You want a new UI. There's things you want to do with it. And in other cases, there might be a complete replacement of a, of a system of record. You may have a system of record that was custom built and now there's a commercial off the shelf product that you are interested in. Um, that you know meets more of your requirements, and maybe you want to replace your custom homegrown application with a commercial off the shelf. So there's several different patterns, and I've used all of these patterns along with this digital core concept. So when you look at the first one, this is when I'm trying to create a new client experience, and this one is a very straightforward one, right? You've got the existing uh, system of record, you're getting the data out into the digital core into Ignite, and now you're building your new UI with the Enterprise API for reading data off of Ignite. Okay, so you can very quickly build new client experiences because you've got all of the data in, in Ignite ready for consumption in these materialized views. Okay, so you could build some interesting UI, some interesting capabilities here. Now, when you wanna use the strangler pattern where you're strangling one vertical slice through your system of record at a time, Again, it's a very similar approach to the previous one, right? You're now figuring out in your existing UI, in your existing system of record, in the existing database, what are the pieces that you are carving out and are going to build on in parallel in a more modernized way, right? And your modern application could be anything, right? You could use some modern UI frameworks. You could be building it in microservices, uh, and, and, and so on. So the right hand side there in that dashed box there, um, that is your modernized vertical slice. Now it's still reading from the uh, Ignite there. Okay. Uh, and you can see that the, the, the system of record part on the left, we've pulled out the database and now your modernized vertical slice has its own database, right? Which is what you would expect. Okay, and the business logic's been pulled out and it's got its own business logic. So you've vertical, you've taken a vertical slice, you've strangled it out of the existing system of record and you've built it out, uh, you know, in, in, in a new architecture and they're going to coexist. And you can see that the digital core in the middle kind of helps with that coexistence and then obviously ignite on top of it with the reads. Okay, and then the next pattern is if you know, if there is a, you've got a system of record that you just want to replace, that there's no uh, hope for it from a, uh, you know, modernizing its standpoint. Um, and, or, you know, typically this is when there are commercial off the shelf products that, you know, clients feel uh, would help them, uh, you know, move much further ahead than modernizing it. Um, they do try to replace them with uh, with uh, COTS products or, or a SaaS offering. And and again, the, the thing about this particular pattern is you are getting the data out of the existing systems of record and putting it in the digital core. And you are putting that data into Ignite and you are exposing materialized views for the enterprise APIs to read from it. And then what you're doing is when you stand up the COTS product or, or the SaaS offering, you're actually hydrating 
the, the COTS product database from the existing uh, system of record database. So the digital core is providing that layer to actually send the data over, right? Because it's ingesting the data from the system of record, and then it's taking the data and hydrating the, the new, uh, what will be the new system of record. And the data is still staying in the digital core because at the, because at the target state, the end state, the digital core is still there. Ignite is still there. People are still reading the data off of Ignite. Um, and so what, what then happens is you eventually shut off uh, the, U, the existing UI, you shut off having the existing system of record send data to the digital core. But in some cases, we do let the digital core send data back to the existing system of record. And the only reason we do that in, in number seven is that the existing system of record serves as a fallback. While, while we shake things down in the new system of record, uh, you know, we want to make sure that we do have a backup and uh, we can fall back to it uh, if we need to. So these were, you know, three um, modernization patterns that we have seen very commonly that we've executed on several times uh, that, uh, that are available when you use a, a pattern like this. So let me spend the next little while just talking through some of the lessons learned and, you know, we will hopefully end at uh, two o'clock sharp and have some time for questions. Um, one of the, 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 biggest points I want to make is, um, you know, you have to provide the development team's training, okay? What what we found was uh, with Ignite, I mean, Ignite is a great product. It's got a lot of features, a lot of capabilities, um, but we can't have, you know, we can't have developers uh, treated like an SQL database, right? Because it, it's, it's not, it's much more than an SQL database. Yes, it supports, you know, SQL and you could, do everything like by treating it as, as an SQL database, but that's not the point, right? So what we found was that, you know, our development teams needed to understand exactly what Ignite is, exactly what the capabilities are. And, and so they can actually leverage it in, in the right way. Okay, so giving, giving the development teams Ignite training was extremely, extremely important because I did not want them to treat it as a SQL database because it is much, much more than a SQL database. Okay. Um, the the second the second point I want to make is the configuration, right? There is just so much configuration um, that uh, you need to understand the configuration. And again, that does tie a bit into the training. I, the training is important for you to know what is what is all of the configuration out there. Yes, you can go into the documentation and 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 look at every single thing you could possibly configure. Um, but what I found was that you know you need to understand. Uh, all of the configuration. You need to think through the configuration um, because all of it matters uh, in, a, in a big way. And especially the cache configuration, right? You want to understand the, the, how you configure those caches. Um, and so it's very, very important uh, that you think through all of the configuration, make sure you made the right choices for the kind of data you have and, and how you're going to actually consume that data. It, it's, it's important to uh, to make sure you have uh, the configuration thought through. Um, when you're doing things at scale, you absolutely have to automate everything. I mean, there was no, you know, when you when you run at scale and you've got many nodes, um, you can do things manually, right? Even the simplest things, if you start doing things manually, you're not going to be able to scale your team, right? So you want to make sure you automate literally everything. Right, uh, whether it's basic admin tasks like stopping and starting things, you 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 have absolutely have to automate everything. Um, you can't do a lot of this uh, this manually. Okay, um, figuring out recoverability. Now, look, I mean, you know, you, there's like I said in the configuration, there's there's lots of configuration. You can configure your caches in so many different ways, right? Um, whether you're going to use a durable memory, whether you're going to have persistence in it or not. Um, you know, what, what if you're just using all, all just memory and then what, what do you do when, when things go down? How do you actually recover, right? And how long does it take to recover? So what we found was you want to figure out, you know, depending on the different data you have, you want to figure out how are you going to recover when there is failure, right? If nodes go down, if your cluster goes down, when it comes back up, how, how are you going to recover? And what was important for us was, how much time does it take, right? What is our recovery time objective? And can we recover within that amount of time, right? So in certain cases where 
you know, we were only leveraging, you know, entirely just memory in Ignite. And, you know, we, we had to have a mechanism to replay the data from a Kafka topic and, and put it back into an Ignite cache. Right. Uh, in other cases where it was, uh, it was uh, we were using persistence. Uh, those are uh, simpler cases to deal with. But you have to really figure out your recoverability. How are you actually going to recover when there is a failure? Okay. And with that, I want to say thank you for listening to this talk. I think we have at least uh, nine minutes. We can take questions uh, uh, here as well. I think. Hi, Shreya. Thank you very much for that talk. It was kind of great to hear um, kind of stories from the trenches. I feel like uh, some of that experience has been uh, pretty hard won by the sound of it. Um, I don't see any questions uh, coming in uh, right now. Uh, so if anyone has any questions, please do put them in the uh, chat or the uh, Q&A windows so we can see them. We can ask uh, Shreya uh, right now while he's actually on the call. Um, so, so how did you feel, uh, so how did you find, I guess, Apache Ignite in, in the first place? Was it something you just kind of Googled for and you found an in-memory data grid and that looked seemed cool? Or did you, uh, you know, what did you, what did you look for? How did you, uh, how did you find it? Uh, well, one of, one of, one of my clients was using it already. Um, and, and that's where we first heard about it. Um, and, and so, you know, s since then we've been at other clients trying to tackle similar problems and it made sense for us to look at the patch ignite as one of those, uh, uh, potential solutions. So it was, it was based on a fact that a client was already using it. We had, we had teams on the ground there. Uh, we did have some experience with it, uh, and we we're using it at scale. And so we knew exactly what those capabilities are. It's always good to have you know, a, a gauge for, hey, you know what? That client's using it and they've got, you know, X amount of data and they've got this much data streaming in in real time every day. It's good to have those numbers because, you know, mentally you can figure out, okay, you know what? I think this could be a, a solution that could work, right? And especially, you know, with some of the work that I'm doing where we have, you know, literally uh, hundreds of millions of messages being processed a day, it's, uh, it's a significant amount. And so, you know, knowing the architecture played a big part as well. You know, we spent a lot of time under the covers trying to figure out, okay, how is this Ignite thing architected, you know? Uh, you know, and, and the fact that is, you know, the clustering aspect, the fact that it's distributed, you know, how everything works under the covers was important for us to know. And the fact that it's all configurable. So it wasn't a one size fits all, right? You, you could use one kind of an approach for some of your data and a different kind of an approach for different kinds of data. And so knowing how it worked under the covers gave us a lot of confidence that, yeah, you know, we, we can get speed out of this, we can scale this and, and so on. So those are the big parts. So you said you had all the kind of training and stuff like that. How, how did you kind of discover like the extra features? Did you talk to the kind of community? Did you play around? Did you look at the source code? Um, we haven't been looking too much at the source code. Uh, I'll tell you that uh, you know we did we did get into it a couple of times, but we haven't looked at the source code much. Uh, uh, but but usually on the community, uh, the blogs uh, the blogs that are out there, uh, some of the documentation and the blog posts that uh, uh, GridGain does uh, are are great. The GridGain webinars are fantastic. We make sure we we join as many of them as we can. We have a, we have a few members on our team that that join regularly. All of the the grid gain webinar. So, so we do, we do learn a lot. And a lot of the hard lessons are basically us getting our hands dirty and trying things. There's no, there's no substitute for actually rolling up your sleeves and bringing IntelliJ up and, and trying it. Uh, but we found, you know, you can't do it on a laptop, you know, because you're, you're missing things out if you're trying to play with it on a laptop. So, you know, uh, for us, you know, we, we set up a cloud environment and we have it running in the cloud and, and basically, you know, that's where we try things because then you get the feel for having many, many nodes and and, and so on. Okay, so we have some. That's good, uh, that's good to hear. Thank you. Um, we have some questions coming in. Um, do you use continuous queries for your materialized views? Uh, we do not. That is something we have thought about, but we do not use uh, continuous queries. 
Okay, um, how do you manage the time lag between writing an update to SLR and reading the updated value from the digital core? Uh, that is an excellent question because, uh, you know, you would have seen that this is an eventually consistent system, right? Um, the book of reference, the digital core is eventually consistent. And we spent a lot of time, uh, you know, we built a concept called tracer bullets where we can trace from source to sync. So from the source system of record to where it's eventual resting place is for the data. And we are, we're doing distributed tracing and monitoring the latency along that data supply chain. So we monitor, we maniacally monitor the latency and make sure that there's no increase in latency. Otherwise alarm bells go off, people get called and we got to figure out the latency. Um, and also at the same time, we're making sure that there's no data loss. Now we've measured this in, in our environment where you know we've got data coming from a system of record uh, and going to uh, going through all of the processing, uh, you know, in in a, in a in a client implementation which is at scale, and usually you know we're looking at you know 230 240 milliseconds uh, end to end. And so when you know someone goes on their mobile banking app and pays a bill and then goes to their transaction history and does a refresh, they see the data of the of the bill they just paid. You know, the 230 250 milliseconds doesn't play that big a role. But, but you have to be careful. You're absolutely right. You know, you have to make sure that you think about the latency because otherwise you have the, you know, read what you write problem, right? And you, you don't want to have that issue. But, uh, you know, we found that we can manage within uh, a very low uh, uh, latency in terms of getting the data into the, the read uh, uh, materialized views. Okay, great. And I think we may have, may have one time for one more question. Um, so the, the next one in the list is on the topic of backup, is there any experience or recommendations for how to do backup in a cluster environment? For example, can this happen online or offline, uh, risks involved? Yeah, backup, yeah, backup is, uh, is, is an important problem. Um, so most of our data that we have is in Kafka and we will replay the data from Kafka into Ignite. So from the Kafka standpoint, we, we, we leverage different techniques, right? So there's obviously you can have uh, the data replicated uh, or you can have a multi-region uh, multi cluster that spans a couple of data centers and, and that basically gets the data across there. So we, we're, we're keeping the data in two different data centers in different regions, but that, that part is happening on the Kafka side. On the Ignite side, when the data, if Ignite was to go down and come back up and we needed to replenish the caches, then we would be basically reading off Kafka and playing it back into the materialized uh, views, into the caches. So our data, we're, the way we're handling the data, it's handled on the Kafka side. But I'm sure you could handle, you could do similar on the Ignite side. Uh, I think maybe squeeze in one last question. Um, so I lied when I said that was the last one. Um, are there any particular financial use cases where this approach has worked best? When we say financial use cases, as in in banking, in in financial like the the industry, or you know, are we talking about? I, I guess it's a financial industry, yeah. Yeah. So I I, I mean we've done you know retail banking right. Um, uh, in, in, in retail banking, we've, we've done it at scale in retail banking. Um, you know, one of the biggest use cases for them was they wanted to build some new products. And the, there were some new products that they wanted to build that they absolutely needed real-time events. And so they couldn't rely on nightly bad jobs that did reconciliation and things of that sort. So they wanted to basically, you know, get real-time events, streaming events. They wanted to combine the data and create these experiences. So in read, we've done it. You know, I you know I can't talk about the individual use cases uh, that the banks are, are are implementing because obviously they're trying to get a leg up on all of the other banks. Uh, but but the retail banking is a perfect example of where we've used the digital core and this real time event streaming and combining data and creating some interesting uh, client experiences. That's great. Thank you, Shay. Um... So thank you again for your presentation and taking uh, these questions. Appreciate your thank time. You. Thank you very much, everyone.